So I want you to think of your marketing messaging like a garden. When, it, when a garden is well cared for and it's doing what it does, the plants thrive and it attracts bees, right? It's doing what it needs to do. And your marketing is attracting your perfect prospects and helping to nurture them to become clients, the ones that are the best fit, right? But when there's noise in the market and you forget about your messaging, like I said, it's not set and forget, then weeds overtake the garden. So that means the plants can't thrive. Bees aren't really attracted to it. You know, your marketing messaging isn't cutting through this noise. Noise can be the environment out there. It can be um, your competitors messaging and your competitors making, you know, a lot of a fuss and yours is just sitting there. So here's the thing. <laughs> here's the thing. I want to share a secret with you. And frankly, it's a little bit embarrassing, but um, my messaging on my LinkedIn profile is awful. It, it has, it's been outdated for a long time and I've let it go. And I'm busy and I know you're busy. So what I'm trying to say here is don't feel bad about it, okay? Like I said, it's busy, we prioritise. The thing is to acknowledge it, know what needs to be done and to move on from here. So that's your, your key message there. <laughs> Don't feel bad, just work on it and let's do something. All right, so I want to share with you a story about Belinda and Paul from Alpha Pest Control really quickly. They were spending too much time and money trying to market to their C-class clients, meaning they weren't profitable clients. So we looked at all their marketing and everything in, in you know, with respect to that in their business. We identified A-class clients. We put together a really powerful marketing message for those A-class prospects and clients. Their referral partners, they built stronger relationships out of that with their referral partners, got more referrals, and they got more direct leads and sales as a result. So that's how powerful your messaging alone can actually be. All right, another show of hands. When you've been to networking meetings online or offline, who has been introduced to someone who says, yeah, hi, I'm Bob. Hi, I'm Jane. Yep, I'm a, an accountant. I'm a marketer, I'm an electrician, you know, and they sort of say who they are up front in terms of their industry. Who, who, who's sort of noticed that? Hands up. Okay. Good to see. Awesome, awesome. Cool. So make a note of that because we have to address this first. And I call it the schema setback. So if you learn anything today, just get this one. What the heck is a schema? And why do I have to listen to this? Well, I can hear that in some of your voices. So ignore this in your marketing messaging and you will be ignored. What's a schema? Well, it's a Greek word meaning an outline or a shape and framework. And what's happening is it's our brain's mental model of our world, including the environment and people. Schema is when our brain likes to box and categorise to help shortcut our thinking and our evaluation of the world. It's there to help us. It allows us to think quickly. It's brain efficiency. It's awesome. But in doing so, it undermines some things we try to do. There's a problem, right? And I call it the schema setback. So when we introduce ourselves by our industry names too early in our marketing message, right, this is what happens. There's a natural brain response happening here. And that is the other person will probably ignore what you're saying. So if I'm not in the space at the moment and someone says, hi, I'm so-and-so, I'm a lawyer. My brain naturally responds to say, great, lovely to meet you. Don't need a lawyer right now. Box and categorize. I know what that's about. It's trying to shortcut. So I'm not going to be open to listening or reading more. Okay. Um, it might be an accountant. And my brain's going, great, nice to meet you, but I've already got an accountant. Don't need you. Switch off sort of thing, right? Don't take it personally. It's just a natural brain response. So what you need to do well, because we're boxing and categorizing, our brain is pigeonholing. We don't want you to be pigeonholed by your industry name, right? So we need to work around this. So two seconds to think about what you use in your messaging and your languaging that's not breaking through at the moment. Have you been using a lot of your industry name? Have you been using a lot of industry jargon? Okay, because you need to start filtering that out and reducing that if that's the case. You've got to break through this wall, right? The schema setback. So let's look at the art of voicing your value to break through that because it overrides the natural response of being ignored and instead helps you start engaging conversations that can lead to new clients. So my voice your value formula, formula encompasses this, which is clients, challenges and care. And what I want you to do is think about your clients, who they are, and again, as we said, what their needs are 
and what their desires are right at this point, six months, 12 months, 18 months, and factor that into your messaging. Also, challenges. What are their challenges? What are the problems they're coming to you for solutions for? And then care is how you care for them. What are your solutions, your services, your products, right? And that needs to be bundled into your messaging. So the best way for me to show you is to look at a transformation example now. So we're going to transform this. This is a financial planning firm. This is the before. This was on their website, right, recently on their website. So welcome to XYZ Firm. We're a financial planning firm and a certified B Corp. We're committed to changing financial futures and our profession for the better. So let's talk about your financial plan and what it's going to do for you. So into the chat box, what are you seeing here? What are you seeing that's wrong with it? David, could you read some of these comments out, please? Sure. Anyone <clears throat> commenting? What? What? Yeah, you have to um, just give them a minute, uh, comments. Yeah, yeah, sorry. What, what are course. you seeing? What are you seeing? What are you saying? What I'm saying, I'm seeing someone giving a certification that's very technical, industry yeah. jargon, jargonized, yeah. yeah, direct into sales and do business. Lots of yeah. we's, <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely, yeah, jargon. It's qualifying themselves, brilliant, yeah, okay, cool. So, and right up front, what we've seen is that schema problem I pointed out to you right in that first sentence. We're a financial planning firm. It's like, oop, yep, okay, I'm out. Don't need it unless I am looking for one. And then it's like, yeah, technical stuff. So let's have a look at the transformation. <clears throat> Are you concerned about your future and retirement? So they're opening up with a question. Well, I've opened it up with a question. <laughs> so already that's arousing some interest for the right people, for the right target market, right? This is about their future and retirement. And if they're concerned, then pay attention. So already it's grabbing the attention of the people they want. Whoops, go back. We help you find thousands of dollars of hidden value in your income and assets you didn't even know you had. So now my brain's going, okay, oh yeah, I know about my assets and my income, but what if there's more I don't know about? You know, it's really got me interested and I want to know more. And this is obviously what they do. This is part of their help, but it's also arousing interest and, and the desire, all right? So this is also desire that I want to do more with my income and assets. Together, we create a plan to secure your financial present and future. Again, my brain's going, okay, got a plan. Security now, security future. I like the sound of that. Again, this is part of the way they care. And this will ensure you have all the resources you ever need to enjoy the lifestyle you desire without the worry of running dry of money. So I get lifestyle and I don't have to worry about running out of money while I do it. Sounds good. I'm open to hearing more now. So now they can introduce their industry, right? They can say we're a financial planning firm and then they can segue into encouraging that prospect to book an appointment and a phone conversation and take the next step, whatever that next step is. So, all right. How do you think that one went? Can you see how that's arousing curiosity and interest? Yeah, with clear results, focused services that prospects can relate to. So that's the sort of transformation we're looking to make. And that's the sort of thing you want to think about now in the next few weeks before Christmas and early January if you don't get to work on it in the next few weeks, right? Okay, cool. So what I'm encouraging you to do is to review, refresh and repackage your marketing this side of 2021 and early 2022 at latest. So three things. Remember, it's not set and forget. Remember the weeds and you've got to cut through that noise and to be proactive about reviewing it and refreshing it. You want to think about breaking through those schemas, the schema setback, and make sure you're stripping out that industry profession and industry jargon right from the beginning, right? Bring it in if it's needed and essential later, but don't bring it in up front. And then voice your value. Use clients, challenges and care. Use that little formula to start framing how you put your messaging out there. Is that making sense and is that cool? Um, yeah, we're getting some. Awesome. Okay, fantastic. Cool. All right. So I just wanted to introduce you to Helen Tarrant, who's a commercial property buyer's agent. We built out automated marketing systems for her. So when I met Helen, she was in a joint venture alliance and she had no lead generation or marketing systems of her own. So for me, that spelt vulnerability. And I discussed that with her. 
So what we did was we sat down and we built out a new marketing funnel and completely refreshed and repackaged her message. Then we built out and automated a prospect nurture sequence in her CRM. That's jargon, right? We built out a way to nurture those prospects into conversations in her database. Her database was in a client relationship management system. That's the CRM. And a fair chunk of that was done on autopilot. So she now enjoys booked appointments coming into her calendar on autopilot because that they're the systems we set up for her. And she can sell her education program on autopilot too, which is what she does. Super cool, yeah? Because we built out some marketing systems. So we mapped out her marketing funnels. We sat down together over a good half day, had some fun, had some lunch, uh, and, you know, put together what um, we thought we'd, we'd, you know, we'd be looking at mapping out and then obviously went out on the back end and built everything out for her in order to have that marketing function. So you're probably doing something with your marketing already, but you might have the problem where you've spent quite a bit of money on ads and you're not seeing maybe the returns exactly that you were after. And that could be because you've not spent some time on your languaging, the upfront piece, that attract piece. Um, And, you know, sort of your messaging is falling on deaf ears because it's not the right messaging perhaps in in the ads. And you're probably even doing some social media marketing or um, content marketing and because you don't have the, any robust system sort of on the back end to support your business, then you've got, you know, potential sales leaking through and falling through the cracks um, and, you know, inquiries going nowhere. So if you're thinking about having your marketing op- operate optimally and you want to do something about it, we might be able to help you. So, um <laughs> Here's my timer. We might be able to help out. And it's probably best to either email me, connect with me on LinkedIn, Uh, or go in and um, book in a conversation. We can have a quick chat to look at what might be missing or broken in your marketing and put together a plan that might, um, not that might, put together a plan that actually will help support your vision and your goals for your business. Um, And that's it. It's been fun. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, Let's give Namiki a nice uh, round of applause. Awesome message. Awesome message. Look, um, I think uh, for people out there who have not reviewed their marketing message, um, really understanding how to change the schema is sometimes easier said than done. And I think Namiki is quite willing to help people on a phone call or on a Zoom call. So if you'd like to reach out to Namiki, I'll get her to pop her email address into the chat box as well uh, when she can. Um, But what I'd like to do right now is I'd like to actually get everybody to, we're we're going to go into some discussion. And I think one of the things with running an event like this is it's easy to get sort of bound up in, um, you know, just watching one way and not meeting other people. So we're going to create some breakout rooms. So I've got Eugene working on this at the moment. We're going to put us, we're going to put you into groups of five people. Now it's simple. All you're going to do is you're going to meet some people you may have never met before. And you're going to do two things. You're going to introduce yourself. Hi, I'm David. This is what I do. Or you're going to try and change your schema. But I want, I want you to identify what was the key element? What was it that uh, Namiki spoke about that resonated with you? Was there something in that presentation that was awesome for you? Did you get a distinction? Did you get an aha moment? Or is it something you're already doing? So we're going to give you five minutes in a breakout room with five people, which means about a minute each. And halfway through, um, Yuge is going to give you a bit of a signal to come back. But make sure you take this time to meet some people. We've been locked away from each other for such a long time that we don't get to socialize much. And I think just getting online and watching one way is not great. I think it's better just to meet some people. So you give me a thumbs up if you've got the breakout rooms ready. And we're going to put you in there. Uh, you're going to introduce yourselves. We've got five minutes. Um, let's get everyone in there. On the count of three, when I count three uh, we're going to go into the breakouts on one, two, and beat breath in, into the breakouts. Everyone's back in the room. How was that? Did we meet some new people? Thumbs up if we did. Yes, we did. Yeah. <laughs> and um, did we learn some things? If you got some great distinctions, maybe into the chat box, what was the number one thing you got out of Namiki's presentation? If you've got some insights, <laughs> let's share those in the chat box. Um, I'd like to introduce our next speaker. So when we talk about uh, this whole idea of getting ready for 2022, and we've really touched on clarifying that marketing message. Uh, the next piece of the puzzle is going to be profitability. And as I mentioned at the start of today's call, you know, often people think about revenue. When we're small, it is all about revenue when we're growing. But once you go over a million dollars in your business, you start to realize 
that it's not about revenue. Bill, how you doing? It's about leftover. Hey, and, um, so we, we're now going to move into um, Damien's presentation. Now, who knows Damien Lacey on this call? Can I get a show of hands for those people? Not a lot. He's a very, very interesting man. He's a systems guy. He used to work with Toyota. He's very much about process. He, he's, a lean, he's a lean consultant, not as in lean skinny, but he's lean skinny as well. Um, and today he's going to be talking about how to supercharge your productivity and profits in 2022. So if we could please uh, give uh, Damien Lacey a nice warm welcome to the call. Let's get him up. Good morning, everyone. <clears throat> um, thanks, David. Thanks to, to the Outcomes Business Group as well for the opportunity to speak to you all this morning. So yeah, as David said, I'll be talking to you today about how to supercharge your productivity and profits uh, for next year, 2022. So firstly, an introduction, my name is Damien Lacey, I'm the founder of OE Partners and OE stands for Operational Excellence. And we work with clients to help them unlock the productivity of their operations. And we do that by applying lean business methods, uh, running lean transformation uh, programs. So there's a bit of background. Um, I myself began working with uh, productivity improvement methods, lean methods around 2002, 2003. I worked in a company called Robert Bosch at that time, automotive uh, manufacturer. They uh, were starting, just starting their uh, productivity improvement, their lean transformation journey at that time. Um, I started working in the team centered around that, the Bosch production system team, which was a really big step for the organization. I got to see a lot of these tools and methods firsthand and also seeing the dramatic impact uh, that they can make. Um, now, a lot of the tools that we refer to and the principles um, came from Toyota. They run a really efficient business. They're the most profitable um, in the industry, I think, except for um, uh, Porsche percentage-wise, but in terms of overall profit, they're the, they're the most profitable. And that's because they run their business in a certain way um, and it, it's incredibly efficient. So I spent a few years in Japan um, le learning from the source, so to speak, came back to Australia watch the automotive industry sort of wind up uh, and then decided to start consulting to Australian businesses on lean and operational excellence. And that led me to found uh, OE Partners, which is uh, six years now. We've got seven people client facing. Uh, we work, work with a range of businesses, um, small to medium enterprises, probably the majority of where we work. Um, and, you know, all the way from software to retail to um, government. But to be honest, the majority of the work that we do is with people who make a physical product or who move a physical product. So construction, manufacturing, warehouse and distribution is, is where we do a lot of our work. Okay, let's, uh, let's get into the workshop. So first of all, I thought I would ask you guys a question. And in terms of um, lean business systems, lean principles, I just wanted to get an understanding of how familiar are you with, um, with those ideas? So if you can just sort of give a red, yellow or a green in the chat box, and then I can get a sense as to what the familiarity in the group is around those ideas. Green, great, some yellow, some reds. Red, 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 green, red. They're coming in now. Good, so it's a, it's a real mix there. That's a real mix. There's some people who've got a lot of experience in greens and then there's a whole bunch of people in red. So, um, you know, I think there'll be some stuff for, for all of us to learn uh, in today's session. Great, thanks very much for that. Now, um, so really what we do is look to help people, uh, organizations improve their performance. And so when we try and do that, uh, we ask our teams to change, to improve, to eliminate waste, we can hit, hit a couple of hurdles, right? Firstly, um, we see quite a lot is people just become blind to the waste that exists within the process. You know, each day um, they're in the same environment, you know, it, it, it's it's almost like a, an inevitability that people kind of just become used to the way that we work. Um, the second thing is that, um, you know, we do we do take the time to, to make changes to improve the way we operate, but those changes don't always deliver on the targets that we set for them. Um, now, first off, it, you know, I, I, I don't want to put it out there, you know, I, we want to say, don't let perfection be the enemy of the good. And any change that registers a win is a good thing. However, you want to have your changes close to the bullseye as possible. 
we want to focus our improvement efforts really on where the constraint is within your business. Because um, if you go to the trouble of identifying and then implementing your change and spend time and resources on it, you want to be really confident it's going to deliver a good result for the organization. And a lot of times we're really busy, we try and invest in change and improvement, but if we don't get a quick enough benefit, we can, some, we can sometimes lose motivation. So we really want to zero in on um, the best changes that will give immediate benefit. And so um, the, the tool I'm going to introduce to you today helps us do exactly that. And it's called value stream mapping. It allows us to really zoom in on the best opportunities that if we fix them today, we'll deliver a benefit tomorrow. Now, I also want to talk about this idea of temporary improvement versus permanent improvement. Um, you know, it's been a dynamic year, let's put it that way, uh, or even longer than that. Some of organizations have had a, a, a drop in revenue, some have had a spike in revenue, um, and that leads us to make decisions and changes within our business. Let's say, for example, we had to cut overtime, we reduced casuals, um, we stood down staff or we delayed non-essential purchases. So we've avoided costs for a period of time, right? But when conditions go back up, you know, we're going to rehire staff, we're going to reintroduce all those overhead expenses and, you know, run the business the way we did before, well, you're going to be right back where you started. You've only temporarily avoided cost. And so once, you know, we get back to a more regular way of working, we really want to think about, okay, how can we make these changes per uh, permanent? Why is it that we had all this over time? Um, you know, if we've had a spike in demand, we really just want to throw labor at it. Um, is there smarter ways of working? And so we want to put in place permanent process improvements that will make us more competitive on the on the other side. And so to help us with that, um, that job, I mean, I'm going to be talking about a really powerful tool used by all leading organizations to streamline their operations. And this, this is part of what allows them to achieve super profits compared to your average business. And I use that, uh, that word super, uh, you know, purposefully. Um, and the tool is called Value Stream Mapping, and it really allows your business to analyze their end-to-end -end, uh, operations and supply chain and really find out where and how to unlock productivity. Like I mentioned before, a lot of businesses, they can struggle to uh, make significant improvements to the way they operate, and each day can seem similar to the one before. And, and a lot of times you hear it being put down to well, I just don't have the time, you know, um, I don't have the time it takes to implement big changes. And, you know, while that can be true for part of the time, I would challenge it and say, a lot of the times we want to change too many things. Um, and the time that we have gets spread thin, and the business may not be investing in the best initiatives. So I mean, for example, right, you could quickly run a brainstorming session with the team and, and come up with 20 ideas to either reduce costs or become more productivity, more, more, more productive. But not all of those 20 ideas will make a bottom line impact, at, le at least not straight away. And, and to, in fact, most of those ideas probably won't. So um, let's talk a little bit about this tool that will help us with it. Um, what is value stream mapping? So it is a one-page representation of all the processes required to create and deliver value uh, for your customers. It looks at the entire organization uh, and everything happen that happens along the value creation uh, chain. So from the moment we take a, uh, an order or a start a conversation with a customer all the way through to the work being done and getting paid for. And it maps out all of those important steps and it does that and it, it, looks at the, it looks at the data, right? It looks at the performance data. And that's really what brings the map to life and tells us what's really happening. Um, and it focuses on flow and anything that interrupts flow because that's interrupting your, your cash flow and your profitability ultimately. So that's a little bit about what it is. Now, the goal with any value stream mapping exercise is to identify the sources of waste across the value chain and to eliminate them. But, you know, what does, what does waste mean? Um, what's wasteful, what's useful. It, it helps to make this a bit clearer and to categorize um, what we do in an organization in terms of waste and um, value add. 
So any activity that you do in your business, it could be you're meeting with your accountant or you're having a strategy session with your team, whatever, you can categorize it into three ways. It's either value adding, as in that's directly related to creating the product or delivering the service that your customer pays for, or it's part of your own business's requirements. So um, <clears throat> the customer doesn't really care about it, but you have to do it, right? So planning your delivery schedule, or recruiting new team members or paying your, your tax, you have to do it. But to be honest, the customer doesn't really care about it, right? They don't need to know about it. And finally, there's things like, uh, you know, that are just pure waste, mistakes, errors, scrap, whatever the case may be. So to make it uh, easy to understand really quickly, let's take something we're all familiar with, right? We walk into a cafe, we walk to the operation, the value adding steps in the cafe, are, you know, heating the milk, adding the sugar, stirring it, putting the lid on it, delivering it to your hand. They're all the things that you as a customer are paying for, you're interested in. The business requirements are, um, bringing supplies, ordering stock, arranging the roster for next week, et cetera, et cetera. And then the pure waste would be getting the order wrong, uh, spilling, spilling the sugar, dealing with a, a broken coffee machine, all those things that shouldn't happen. You target zero for those things. Now, to improve the profitability of, organ of an organization, it's really simple. There's only two things you need to do. Um, you either increase your sales, or you reduce your costs, right? Sounds so simple. Um, and the, the beautiful thing about uh, waste and elimination, why I get so excited about it, is that by eliminating the pure waste and then freeing up capacity um, within your business, you do both things, right? You reduce costs and you can increase your output um, and, and boost your productivity. And then that will directly relate to profitability. Now, another commonly shocking statistic when we go through this value stream mapping exercise with clients is, and we add up all of the direct activity from start to finish within a, a process, is that it turns out on average, only 5% of the time that gets spent in an organization uh, and the activity is actually value adding. I'm gonna pause there and, and just let that sink in, only 5% right, of what happens and the time that gets spent is value adding and the rest is either uh, non-value adding for your business or it's just pure waste. And some people can be a bit confronted by that. Oh, hang on, I'm sure they were a bit better than that. But it's surprising that you go through the exercise and it, it comes out again and again that uh, that's, that's roughly the amount of, uh, of time that gets spent. And so if you've got team members that think, you know, we're pretty good, we're pretty efficient, I don't think there's that much room for improvement, the chances are that they've simply become blind to it and they've assumed that what they do to run the process is, is evaluated when it's, it's not and there's, there's opportunity for improvement. Very good. So we want to eliminate waste, reduce the non-value add and then standardise and improve our uh, value add. Okay, so how does value stream mapping help, right? Um, so let me just run through a quick case study uh, where we were engaged uh, with a company called Orcon Steel, one of their distribution centers. Look, they weren't able to keep up with deliveries. Customers were unhappy. Their costs, um, labor costs per sales were quite high. And so the process itself was actually a combination of manual labor and automation it ran 24 seven. Customer demand was constantly changing. Um, and there were a few theories about what might be causing the issue, but because things are so dynamic, you know, it's not the same thing every day. It's constantly changing seasonal factors. It was hard to see what was going on and only incremental improvements have been made. So in this instance, um, the beneficial outcome of, of our stream mapping and, and the data analysis was that we discovered pretty much where the entire operation was getting constrained, right? And it was all getting constrained at one particular process step, a picking station, right? And I think it was picking station number two. Uh, material wasn't being supplied property, properly. The operator was getting taken away for other jobs. Sometimes it would run slow. There was no sense of urgency because, you know, it's just one other step in the process, right? Um, but that's exactly where the problem was. And so once we knew that, um, we made targeted improvements, fixed the supply issues, made it a rule that this 
process never stops, right? Never, ever, ever stops. And made sure that everything that was happening there was really standardized, really improved. Um, and the results were pretty, pretty significant, right? Um, delivery improved by 30%. That's 30% delivery performance on time uh, improved. And that wasn't achieved by labor getting thrown at it. That was um, labor requirements actually dropped, right, by 27%. So that was a really good example of finding out where the constraints were. Now, the second uh, thing that valuation mapping allows you to do is just in general, once you map it out and unpack it, you can see where huge amounts of waste and inefficiencies exist. And so this is another example of a client there, uh, ASX, ASX listed in prefab construction. And a particular product was actually losing money, right? So the more they sold, the more they lost, okay? Which is not a great place to be. Um, so in this instance, uh, you know, value stream mapping wasn't so much about pinpointing a bottleneck. It was just realizing that, wow, there's just a better way of running um, the process. So we completely redesigned the approach. And yeah, this, the results were significant. A 95% uh, reduction in, um, in lead time. So the time it start takes to finish one from start to finish and the labor requirements drop by 25%. And then obviously when you've got things happening faster with um, more efficiency, you get more out, right? And so the output increased by <clears throat> 2.5 times and naturally profitability then increased. So that was a really good profitability improvement of almost a million dollars profit uh, per annum. <clears throat> so definitely worth, worth the exercise. So um, that's a couple of examples of um, what's possible, right? And we're not talking about ones and 2% here. We're talking about step change improvement that is possible that allows business to become dramatically more profitable. Um, so, from here, I would say that if you've got a sense that your operation isn't running as effectively as it should be, um, or the change and improvements that you'd like to see just aren't happening fast enough, then you could be leaving money on the table, right? Lean organizations, they're, they're more profitable. It's, it's that simple. So if you're looking for advice, uh, we generally start with a phone call. We may be able to help, we may not. Um, and generally to work that out, we would, we would start with a, a phone call or a Zoom call to get an understanding of your current state, simple operational assessment, and then suggest some, some next steps from there. So if you're interested in that, um, you know, go ahead and type in yes in the, in the chat box, and then we'll, we'll get in touch uh, after to set up that, that conversation. And right now there is some federal funding, federal government funding to support with, uh, with this kind of activity. So uh, it, could be, it could be a good time to, uh, to, uh, to start the conversation. So by all means, uh, type in uh, yes there and we'll, we'll see where the conversation goes. Great, thank you very much. Hopefully I got the, that in on time, David. Well, well and truly actually. So let's all give uh, Adrian, uh, Damien, just say Adrian, Damien, round of applause, awesome presentation, great timing. Um, it's been awesome so far, isn't it? We're really thinking about how we work smarter and not harder for next year, 2022. Um, we've had two great presenters. Damien's message is always exciting for me I, because I keep reminding people, you know, it's about efficiency. It's about profitability. And if you're not looking at your process, it's going to be inefficient. And when he said 5% is value, it's terrifying. It's a terrifying <laughs> stat and people don't believe it. And they say, no, that can't be true. We're good at what we do. And he goes in and does his mathematics and sure enough, he knows his numbers, right? So um, yeah, by all means, if anyone's interested in having a chat with Damien, he's very approachable about this and it doesn't just apply to manufacture, right? Any processing that you do, so it could be services, it could be anything, um, value stream mapping works. We all saw the post-it note wall. We love the post-it note wall. We've had one of those in our office as well. Um, what we're gonna do right now is uh, same thing as before. We're going to put people in a breakout. It's really just to chat a bit about what you learned, some insights. Um, Eugene, can we make some new breakout potentially? Um, just so people can meet some new people. And uh, we're going to put you in those rooms for uh, five minutes just to say good day, introduce yourself, talk a bit about what you've learned so far from both presenters, what's resonated with you so far. And we're going to see you back in this room in about five minutes. So on the count of three, we're going to take a deep breath and jump into some rooms. One, two, and <gasps> beautiful. As everyone's coming back in, just to maybe in the chat box, what's been most useful so far out of today's session? What have you learned? What's been the distinction? You know, what, what's worked for you? What are you excited about? So how was that? Hopefully people got some uh, great insights. Did you meet some new people? Thumbs up if you did. 
Awesome. Um, Learn some new things. It's been a great day. I love it when we get some insight and really planning is just about thinking and often people are too busy to stop and just think about how do I do it better? Our next presenter. Um, who, who knows Brett Hansen on the call? Can I just get a show of hands for those? Yay, there's the Brett fan club right there. <laughs> awesome. Um, what we're going to be doing is uh, we're going to be uh, getting Brett to come on board and he's going to be talking about this uh, chasm called summer and we're going to be talking about cash flow. So one of the critical elements, you know, they talk about, um, you know, revenue being vanity, profit being sanity, but cash flow is king in business. And I think often we forget that uh, without cash flow, that's the lifeblood of business. So I've asked Brett to really sort of highlight what happens over Christmas and how do people make sure that they've sort of thought this through and they've planned so that when they hit 2020 and they come back, there's petrol in the tank to get them going. So if you'd like to give Brett a nice warm welcome to the call. Hey, Brett, you're up. Thank you, David. Um, if you can put me on speaker mode and that'd be great. Um, great to see you all uh, this morning. Um, Dave, thanks for ha having me along today and, and to making Daniel great uh, presentations this morning. Um, who am I? Well, sorry, Namiki, I'm going to have to say I'm an accountant, uh, but hopefully I'm not seen as just a normal accountant. Um, I like to think of myself as a little bit different. So probably a bit of my background, I actually started um, my accounting uh, work life at Channel 7. Uh, I worked a lot in uh, production and sport programs. So many businesses in themselves. Um, but and was lucky enough to go to the Atlanta Olympics. But out of that, I really felt that Channel 7 was getting tired for me and my old man uh, ran his own accounting firm. So he said, come along, come over and join me and we'll, we'll, we'll work with small businesses together. So 23 years ago, joined my father in public practice and basically been there ever since. And what, what I love about public practice is working with small and medium businesses, mums and dads, business owners that are, that are basically um, really trying to, to live their life, um, but often come across different problems within um, their business and in, their, their, in what they're trying to do. So our biggest um, thing, I am currently Director and CEO of Hanson & Wills. We operate out of Mount Waverley in Victoria, and we're a business advisor and accounting firm. Um, but our main focus really is, yes, we can do the accounts and tax work, but we really like to educate our clients. We really want to educate where they are, where they're going, what they're doing um, within the business. And, and part of today is, you know, working through um, different areas, whether it be marketing and profitability that we may or may not be able to help them with. So really today, what I want to talk about initially is, again, that Christmas cash chasm, investigating the, the, the hole that we sit in. We're leading up to Christmas. Santa's coming to town. Everything's looking rosy. Yep, we've finally come out of COVID. Um, you've worked hard to get back into your business and hopefully get a cash flow that might surprisingly look good. You want to finally take that holiday, the holiday you haven't had for two or three years. Um, and you don't, want to, you don't want to think about business for three weeks, do you? But what I want to know from everyone is, is, is anyone actually prepared um, for that Christmas break in their business? Is anyone actually, if you are, put your hand up. Um, but I don't believe many people in business actually prepare for that Christmas break. So before I get, get into that today, I'm going to take you back about 12 years. I'm going to take you back to a time in 2010 when... Great year. Collingwood won the premiership. Um, don't know whether you know, it was the year that Prince William and Kate got married and a French horse came along and took our Melbourne Cup. But I just turned 38. Um, owned my own home, a couple of great kids, really doing well in business, enjoying business. But I had this void in my life, uh, a void that really... I hadn't done anything. <laughs> I had mates that played over for footy. I had another mate who, you know, did world on my Ironman triathlons. And I was stuck in an accounting business. I really had this void and I'd really done nothing to get myself out of a, uh, out of a comfort zone. So as we usually do after a few drinks, New Year's Eve, December 31st, 2010, I thought, you know what, I'm going to put my balls on the line here. I've been thinking for a few months about something that I was going to do. So friends and family around, and I stuck my hand up and I said, you know what I'm going to do? 
before the turn before the time I turn 40, in two years' time, I'm going to run a marathon. Now, some of you out there, I don't know whether anyone's run a marathon. Some of you out there might say, oh, it's not much, you know, run, run 42 Ks. People do it all the time. Well, I actually hadn't run 100 metres in probably 15 years since I stopped playing footy back in 1997, effectively, if not longer. So everyone just laughed at me. <laughs> I was, you know, again, after a few drinks, everyone's going, how are you going to do that? So the first thing I had to do was start running. Well, because it was Christmas, Christmas holidays, I didn't really do anything, did I? So I got to February and I thought, oh, I better start doing this thing because I'm going to look like a bit of an idiot. So I went for a first run in February. Uh, I went for six minutes. Uh, and then within two weeks, I'd already done my first calf. Then uh, got over that, get another couple of weeks down the track, the other calf goes. So the dreaded old man's curse. So I was actually starting to look like a bit of a fool. So therefore, at that time, what was it? Now, March, my mate come to me. He was there that New Year's Eve. My mate, Dave, he come to me and said, mate, he said, I know what you've done. I'm going to come and, I'm going to come and run with you. I'm going to come and help you. And we're going to do the marathon together. So over the next 18 months, we went for a few runs um, we chipped away at the kilometres, but we, we didn't really get serious. We actually got to November, December 2011. Guess what happened? Christmas came. So stop training, you know, go away, have a few beers, have a few luncheons, you know. So therefore, I get to the end of January and, uh-oh, I've, I've hit, hit that Christmas chasm. I hit that hole in my training. So... We had to get started again. Dave's come along. He goes, come on, mate. We've got to get going again. Got to get going again. So I had to get motivated. We finally got up to mid-June 2012, and we ran a half marathon. I thought, right, this is the start of it. So the motivation was actually to enrol in the Melbourne Marathon. Melbourne Marathon was October 2012. Gave me a few months. So logged in, paid my 125 bucks. I was in. I was done. So... Right, finally, we're getting this done. Then I had to thought, how the hell do I prepare for a marathon? The most I've done is 21 Ks. I've got to run 42 Ks. So Googled, how do you prepare for a marathon? Got my training gear. And basically, once you've done that sort of running, you only really need to train for six weeks. So we put a plan in together uh, that you train for six weeks in the lead up and we got to two weeks beforehand and then you taper off. So those six weeks, you don't all of a sudden start running 30, 35 Ks a week. You actually increase it by two kilometres per week. So through that six-week program, we started at the 20 Ks. We got up to, eventually, we ended two weeks before the marathon. We ran 32 Ks. That was the longest we'd run. Some people might say, you got to run 42 Ks. No, you run 32 because the last 10, you just run on adrenaline hope at the end of the day. So now I was committed, no turning back. We're ready to go. So then we're going to tapering. If anyone doesn't know what tapering is, I never really knew it was. Always heard about it in swimming terms, in terms of the Olympics. Tapering is basically taking that level back, let your mind rest, let your body rest. So you, you only do a few different runs, but that's your, that's your real preparation stage of running for a marathon. You're actually resting up, getting your body prepared. So we got to a week to go. Basically, it was Monday, just before the marathon, and I fell on a heap. I didn't want to do it. I wanted to pull out, and I said to Dave, I'm not doing this. I, I, I couldn't get my head around. I panicked, and I didn't want to do it. And to me, in business, that's what we often get to when we hit Christmas. We've got cash, and we've got cash flow. And that fun of running and running the business through the year can often become the pain of a Christmas cash flow chasm. So a number of the businesses that we work with this time of the year, they've run a lot of those miles. They've accomplished a lot, suffered a bit, ploughed through the year. And, and we talk about tapering. Well, Christmas is their time for tapering. We want to refresh their minds, their bodies, their thoughts. We want them to get away for, get away. But especially this year, are they ready to and can they afford to? So leading up to the Christmas period now, where it's going to become a real pain, we need to plan for that pain. 
So for anywhere between two and four weeks, we're going to, we're going to taper off because we're going to have Christmas physically and mentally. We want to, we want to get ready, but we often forget about what happens, what has to happen cash flow wise over that Christmas period because we've got no income coming in. Hands up, who doesn't have any income during um, during Christmas? They're shut down. They don't want to see customers. They don't want to deal with them. They're shut down. You know, we see some tradies or especially uh, property developers or those in trade, they don't reopen until the 27th of January. They're, they're close for four to six weeks. But we've still got all those expenses. We've got employees that we've got to, they're on leave. We've got to pay their leave weekly or fortnightly. We've got landlord commitments. We've got to pay our rent. They're not, they're not saying, well, you're not in the office. You can't pay, you don't have to pay rent. We've got uh, plant, you know, equipment leases. We've got car leases. Um, we're going to ensure that we're ready when we come back into the office or back into the factory that we've actually got some money left. Um, so that's where that planning comes into play. And what that does is if you're not planning, you hit that cash chasm, as I talked about, in February, if not February, March. You might be cashed up at the start of Christmas, but we go away, we forget about things, we pay things, we get to mid-January, February, March, we've got no money left. We're really risking our business. We're really risking that coming out of Christmas, our business is going to fall over. So what do we do? What are the three things that we need to really look at now? So the first thing is really knowing where you're at. So the biggest part of preparation is, and as I talked to you about with my marathon, is that who's your Dave? Who's there helping you get through this period? So what Dave did for me was sitting beside me and helping through and helping me understand what I had to do, what it meant by a run, what it meant by training properly. So we knew where we were at. So knowing where you're at, at this point, is physically saying right now, how much money have you got in the bank? Who owes you money? And when are they going to pay? Who do you owe money to? And when do they want it? Can it be delayed? If it can't, why can't it? Do, the, do your actually suppliers have the goods ready to go? Your suppliers, whether it's goods or services, are they going to be ready for you come January, February, when you're expecting that? What else do you need? Freight. We all know what it's like at the moment. Australia Post, Star Trek, or whatever, they're taking forever to, to deliver goods. I ordered some T-shirts about a month ago. I still haven't got them. We know that at, at the moment, and especially with online deliveries for Christmas and all those type of things, um, it's going to take longer and longer. So are the things that you're expecting to arrive January, February, to put in place, are they going to actually arrive? So just to give you a story, a client of mine, Jeff, Accent Global, he works in, he basically makes electronic slot, uh, signs, uh, manufactures all, you'll see them all over the freeways. Um, you'll see them also at bus terminals, skylines, airports, racetracks. And basically they deal with government departments, Vic Roads, Brisbane City Council, all that type of stuff. So in 2019, Jeff won a large million dollar uh, contract with the Brisbane City Council. Now, if you deal, we all know if we're dealing with councils, how hopeless we, they are and how hopeless the people that work with them they are. So you need to have your ducks in order. So the contract was for 100 signs to be manufactured, delivered and installed basically by Christmas. Well, these were for bus stops around. And effectively, all the signs were manufactured, done and installed by October. Now, the final payment that Jeff was to receive was $250,000 on the 15th of December, 2019. Now, he knew, needed, he, he basically known what he'd done. He knew that the payment was really important for his Christmas uh, period. But the biggest problem was he didn't communicate with the council. Hang on. You've got to be able to communicate with the council. But he didn't do that. Apologies, everyone. I hope you can see me now. David, can you just let me know? We can see you. 
Yeah. Good. So that goes. <laughs> good. Yeah. So basically, he didn't he didn't confirm with the council about the final payment. So the final payment was meant to be made on December the fifteenth. Didn't happen. So he then had to communicate with the council, didn't he? He then had to ring them. Oh, they had an issue. Apparently something that happened back in October, there was three or four signs that sort of weren't really working properly. So his contract didn't uh, wasn't fully fulfilled and therefore he didn't get paid. Well, this meant that Jeff had to then spend the next four weeks working over Christmas, bringing a team in over Christmas, um, making sure that uh, the, 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 uh, the problems that occurred were fixed. They were, but it eventually meant that he didn't get paid until the end of February. So massive issues, massive issues. So since then, we've worked through things, but because of COVID as well, he's now only really trying to get back on track. Second thing, visualising the finish line. Visualising the finish line is effectively projecting out what it's going to look like when you return. So how do you do that? Well, you do that by physically putting the numbers on paper, projecting out a cash flow of what is it going to look like from now all the way through to March. I call it the Christmas cash flow uh, calculator, basically. So we developed this calculator. So if you want a copy of this calculator, put it in the chat um, and we can send it out to you. But basically, it's a calculator that, that uh, goes through all your ins and outs for the next five or six months. What income you're going to receive? Because you're going to know what income you're going to receive because you've, you've, you're going to go out and talk to your customers. You're going to go out and talk to your suppliers. So what, what payments are you going to have to make? Especially over that three or four weeks break in Christmas. What revenue do you actually need to generate in November and even in December that sees that you get paid in January and February. Because you might do all the work in, in November, December, but you've got to ensure that when you get back, you've got cash coming in the door. And then also, once you come back, what revenue are you going to uh, target when you get back in January, in February? What are the jobs that you're going to do to ensure that you get paid and you keep going to make 2022? a bumpy year for you. So again, make sure you put in the chat, do you want this tool? And we can get it, get it through for you. The final step is steps that you can take now. So those steps, those action that you can actually take now is, of course, as I said, making things happen. Make sure you talk to your customers. Make sure you talk to your suppliers. Your suppliers are just as important as your customers. You need to know when money's coming in the door as you need to know when money's going out to the door. And most importantly, from that point of view, is if you've then got that position of knowing exactly where your cash is, then you can make decisions and you can take action because you've got support and you've got to get got yourself prepared. So what do I mean by that? Well, if you're looking at a bit of a cash flow hole and you know by doing that report, doing that calculator, that you're actually going to go into negative, you don't have an overdraft and you're going to go into negative mid-February, late February, what are we going to do? Well, we can now communicate with people like our banks, communicate with people that are going to support us and we can give them time, giving them time to actually make decisions because we know what banks are like at the moment. It's hard enough to get 50 cents, let alone 50,000 or 500,000. So you need to give them time. So if you're looking in February or March, because of what's going to happen during November, December, January, if you're looking that you're going to have that hole in February or March, you need to get to the bank now and saying, Joe, I need 100 grand, but I don't need it now. Get prepared. I'm going to need it on February the 28th. They're going to deal with you better doing that than what they are if, you don't, if you're not prepared and you're not ready to go. So in essence, it's still time. You've still got time to act. You've still got time to get that support. You've still got time to get prepared. It's only November. 
We're all now preparing for Christmas, buying our Christmas presents, um, you know, uh, probably even buying some things for Christmas lunch, maybe turkeys and hams and all that type of stuff. So what are your final preparations over the next four weeks before you shut down? 2022, hopefully, will be so much better than the last two years. But there's going to be changes in 2022. The ATO are no longer going to be Mr. Nice Guy. They're going to start following up on debts, on late payments. The banks, there's no more COVID relief. There's no more loan deferrals. So you need to have all your ducks in order to make sure you know where you're at. So going back to the marathon. After freaking out, I completed my carb loading. Carb loading was that week, pasta, yogurt, all that type of stuff, getting all that into you so make sure you're ready. But the biggest thing that I did in preparation, I was listening to SEN on the Friday morning just before the marathon. And I think it was Andy Ma, don't really like him, but anyway, I think it was Andy Ma and he had Australian marathoner Lisa Waitman on the program. And he said to Lisa, Lisa, what advice do you give a novice runner? Never run a marathon before. What advice would you give them for Sunday? And Lisa said, first five, last five. And he's going, what? what are you talking about? She said, first five, last five. The first five Ks fuel your last five Ks. So I took that into my marathon. We got, got to Sunday. And as often happens in fun runs, but especially marathons, the gun goes off and everyone goes crazy. You get caught up in all the euphoria. You're running a marathon, all this type of stuff, and everyone goes really fast. Dave was one of them. So I had to hold him back. He goes, well, mate, what are you doing? I said, mate, first five, last five. He goes, what are you talking about? I said, just stick with me, first five Ks, and we'll be all right. So we're trudging along on our marathon, and he's still trying to go fast, but four hours and 18 minutes later, we crossed the line. We got into the MCG for the first time in a couple of years that the run had been there. We crossed the line, and I finally crossed that, that my own chasm of, from what I had finally accomplished something. And it was something that effectively only a million people per year around the whole world um, complete, 0.01% of the population. So in taking that into account, not many people do it. But where I got through it was because I set my target, I planned, I got support, and I got prepared. I got prepared for some poles that got in place, but I had the support there to help me through those holes, be it Dave, be it a commentary from Lisa Waitman. That's what really got me through. So, guys, in finishing up, I hope you can really accomplish something in business next year. But if I can give you one tip is make sure you plan for it now. So, again, if you want that cash flow chasm calculator, yell out. because if And if yell out also if you need some help, um, call us here at Hanson's. Um, we can get you through that Christmas period. And maybe, you know what, maybe we can be your Dave. So... Thank you for today, and I hope you got something out of it and appreciate it again, David. Thank you. Amazing. <laughs> what a great story. Let's all give uh, Brad a nice uh, round of applause. Amazing storytelling. Um, I love the story. I went through the whole process myself. I did a marathon about five, oh, ten years ago now. Probably the same one. But uh, <laughs> Good, mate. I didn't have a Dave. I had a few Daves. <laughs> um, but really, I, I think if we think about what you talked about there, it's, uh, it's just preparing for the inevitable. Because I think sometimes it's funny how people come to Christmas and they go, oh, we've got no cash. But it's the same every year. And what you said about going to the bank, when you go to the bank when you need money is when they start to play funny buggers. Yeah. When you go to the bank with a plan and they start to understand that you're actually, on the 28th of February, I need 100000 Wow, you must be a good business person. Yeah, you got, And all you've really done is map it out. So I think sometimes people look, don't look past the numbers. And really what you described today is this whole notion of just knowing where you're going to be in the future and using that information to make sure you can carry through. Because I think the, the whole side effect of not having the preparation in Jan is that other people who have got cash will now beat you in the game of business. Because when everyone comes back, the people without cash have to stall. And it's like that first five, last five metaphor. I love that. Yeah, yeah keep that in my mind. <laughs> so, um, Look, we're, we're two minutes from the hour. Normally we have Q&A 
And I don't know if anyone has to leave, but if you've got questions of any of the presenters, uh, now's your chance to throw them into the chat box. Um, obviously, each of the presenters had a very powerful message today. And I think for most people on this call, we really have to be thinking about how do we prepare for 2022? How do we prepare for 2022? And how do we make sure that we've got our ducks in a row? We've had three messages today. One is to get my marketing message clear and concise so that I can start the year and get traction. The other one is that I can look at my profitability through workflow improvement. And the third one was really understanding your cash flow position and not being disadvantaged by not having cash in the bank at the right time. So really just planning ahead so you know where you're going to be. Each one of these messages is super powerful for 2022. We don't know what's going to happen next year. But what I do know is people who plan for the future can optimize their chance of success. So if anyone, by the way, there's been quite a lot of information dumped today. If anyone was interested in getting a copy of the slides from the presenters, if you just type slides into the chat right now, I'll make sure that we get those slides and we can share them with you because there was some pretty valuable information in there, especially with Namiki and um, with Damien. They had a lot of information on there. So anyone who'd be interested in getting those slides, let us know. Um, each one of these presenters is highly accessible, which means if you want to reach out to them and ask questions, they're more than welcome. They're more than happy to have a quick chat with you to assess whether they can help you. Don't wait till the last minute to get the help. Reach out to these people and just ask them a few questions. See if they can help you. And just make sure that 2022 is going to be an awesome year for you. So before we wrap up, just a couple of last points that I'd like to make. Um, one of my favorite quotes in the world, this one. Jim Rohn, famous philosopher, said, never wish life were easier, wish you were better. And when we have events like this, you're here to learn. And when we learn how to be better, our world becomes better. And the last one that I love to quote is Bruce Lee, one of my other favorite philosophers in business. He says, knowing this stuff's not enough. We've got to actually make sure we take some action. We've got to do things, right? We must apply the knowledge. So sitting here for an hour and a half and learning this great stuff is amazing. But if you don't have an action plan, if you don't actually have a list of two or three activities that you will do as a result of today, you might walk away with just some great knowledge, but some very little action. So please, in these last few moments, if you can write down what have been your top three lessons that you've received out of today and what is it that you're going to do differently? What are the actions that you will take as a result of today's presentation? Don't leave today without at least one or two or three activities that you will do as a result of today. And that way we can make sure that you get the most out of a session like this. I'm just going to give you a minute to do that. And also, if you have any questions into the chat box, um, the presenters will be around for a little while. If you wouldn't to reach out to them afterwards, you're more than welcome to. Um, Let's give them a nice uh, thank you. Unmute yourselves all and say thanks to the presenters. Make sure that they know that you love them um, before we head off. Thank you. Thank you. That was so good. Thank you. Thanks, thanks everyone. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, everyone. Cheers. Thank you. Thanks, Brad. Peter. Thank you. Awesome. Guys, it's 10.02, so we're going to check out here. Enjoy the rest of your day. Hope you got some great value out of today's session and look forward to catching up with you guys in the future. Thanks, David. Yeah. Thank, you. Nice. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thanks for being involved, everyone.